Welcome to our program. I'm your host, Sonny Cudd. Fires during the holidays, they can quickly turn the happiest of times into the saddest. Annually, winter holiday fires kill 500 people and injure around 2,000. These fires also cause more than $500 million in damage. It's a real problem. First on today's edition, we'll look at Christmas tree safety. Then we'll discuss ways you can avoid fires from candle accidents. After that, we'll talk a little bit about cooking safety. And then finally, we'll give you some important insights on safety around fireworks. Many of these holiday fires can be prevented, and that's what our program is all about, to help you act wisely and promptly to save yourself, your family, and your property from fire. We want you to have the facts on fire. Most fires that I've seen in the fire that I'm speaking of, uh, the tree was knocked over onto a, a combustible. So proper securement of the tree is very, very important. Look at where your tree is. Look at how it can fall. Exactly what, what can it fall on? What can it fall up against? Uh, most fires, including the one where these people lost everything they had at Christmas time, including their Christmas gifts, happened because the tree toppled over onto an open flame. Here are some spot quiz questions. How do you know what's a safe Christmas tree versus one that's not? How far should your tree be from heat sources? Are all holiday lights safe? How often should you put water in the tree stand? When is it time to throw your tree out? Jot those down and take a shot at the answers. And stay tuned to find out what else you can do to stay safe during the holidays. Celebrating during different seasons of the year is a great thing to do, but we need to be aware of certain dangers to our families and to our property. First, let's look at the issue of Christmas trees. Joining me in the studio is Fire Chief Rick Boudreaux. Chief, have you seen any uh, fires in your career where a Christmas tree started the fire? I've seen several fires during my career where the Christmas tree started the fire. These are particularly devastating because of the holiday season. Uh, they put a huge damper not only on the victim's holiday season, but also their extended family and network of friends who have to step up and support these people through this event. Okay. So let's start from the beginning. When a person goes to buy a Christmas tree uh, to, for the holiday season, what should they be looking for uh, when they're picking a tree out? First off, when you're selecting your tree, you should shake the tree. Make sure that not too many needles fall off. If the needles fall off in abundance, the tree's already too dry and shouldn't be purchased. After that, bend the limbs. See if the limbs are brittle or if they're still flexible and, and still moist. Also check the bottom of the stump. It should be tacky or sticky like a freshly cut tree. If it's dry, that tree shouldn't be purchased. Okay. Once we get our tree home, uh, of course, we need to maintain that tree. Uh, what are some of the things that we can do to maintain the tree to keep it from becoming a fire hazard during the holiday season? Well, once you get your tree at home, you should put the tree up in a sensible location, more than three feet away from any heat sources. Even a heat register from a central heating system can dry that tree prematurely. Secondly, we should make sure that the tree is kept moist. It should have water and be checked daily and water added when it's needed. Also, using lighting that's UL approved. We should only have UL approved lighting, and that lighting should be checked before we install it on the tree to make sure that it's not frayed or damaged in any way. Right. That's great. Uh, so, let's hope, hopefully, you know, we get through the holiday season and everything goes fine. Now the season's over with. It's time to get rid of that tree. So, how do I, how do I get rid of that tree? Where do I bring it? Most trees can make it through the holiday season. A tree should be good for at least two weeks of time. If the tree does start to exhibit uh, falling needles or uh, drooping branches, we should go ahead and, and remove that tree from the house, place it in a bag, and bring it to a recycle center or put it curbside for the proper people to pick up. Okay. Uh, to just close this out, what, uh, what do you think are some of the more common misperceptions uh, that people have about Christmas trees and, and having Christmas trees in their home during the holidays? Some of the more common misperceptions about trees are their safety. I mean, people are, are, have trees every holiday season. They've grown up with trees, so they believe them to be safe. The fact is that trees are responsible, or holiday decorations in whole, are responsible for more than 1,200 home fires a year. 
Uh, secondly, our businesses, our local businesses like to get into the holiday season. They like to be festive. So they'll start putting up trees without first checking with their local code authority to make sure that there's no restrictions on that. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that information. In addition to those precautions, you should also have working smoke alarms on each level of your house. In the event a fire should break out from a Christmas tree or some other area of the house, you have a warning to get out of the house. In fact, your chances of surviving a fire are doubled if you have a working smoke alarm. Smoke alarms do save lives. Let's go through the step-by-step -step process for selecting a Christmas tree. Here you see the Andersons looking for a healthy tree. They're shaking the tree and bending the branches to see if any needles are falling off. Next, they're feeling the tree trunk to see if it's still sappy and sticky. It's passed both those tests, so they've decided to pick this one. Once they've gotten the tree back home, they have to maintain it. They check every day to see that there's enough water in the base. They also make sure that the tree is away from any combustible or heat sources. And finally, they're making sure that the bulbs are hung away from the electrical cords or the lights. By following these safe steps, you can maximize the safety of your tree and help prevent a fire in your home. 80% of all fire deaths occur in the home. During the holiday season, nearly 1,200 home fires are started by improper use of trees and candles. About 200 of those fires are caused when Christmas trees are ignited. Minimize your chances of having a fire in your home during the holidays. Prepare now to defend your home from fire. In the long run, it'll be worth it. We are rejoined by Chief Boudreau here in the studio. Chief, uh, what can people do in case a fire was to break out caused by a Christmas tree fire in their home? Hopefully all of our families out there are prepared. They should have a working smoke detector that would alert them to the fire. And they should regularly practice exit drills in the home, have a common meeting place in the yard, and a plan to go to a neighbor's house to dial 911 to alert the fire department to the problem. Thanks, Chief, for more good information. Holidays should be a happy time, not a time of tragedy. Christmas trees account for almost 500 house fires each holiday season. Fires that could have been prevented. Never place your tree too close to a fireplace or heater. Keep your tree well watered. If it dries out, throw it out. Check lights for frayed or broken insulation. And never leave your house with candles still burning. Keep your home safe during the holidays. Don't play with fire. Now it's time to see how you did on that spot quiz. How do you know what's a safe Christmas tree versus one that's not? First, when selecting a tree, shake the branches to see if any needles fall out. If needles fall out, then the tree is too dry and poses a safety hazard. If the needles are green and stay on the tree, that's an indication that the tree is moist enough and therefore not a safety hazard. Also, the trunk should be sticky to the touch. If you're planning on getting an artificial tree, make sure it's approved by a testing laboratory and made of fire retardant material. All holiday decorations should be non-flammable or flame retardant as well. How far should your tree be from heat sources? Your tree should be at least three feet away from any heat sources like stoves, heaters, or candles. Position it near enough to an electrical outlet so you don't have to run extension cords long distances through the house. Are all holiday lights safe? No, the leading cause of Christmas tree fires is electrical arcing. If your lights have worn or frayed cords or loose bulb connections, they're a hazard. Throw them out. Never link more than three light strands unless the directions say that's okay. You should connect lights to an extension cord before plugging them into an outlet. Never use electric lights on a metal tree. And remember to use only tree lights designated for indoor use. Unplug lights when you're leaving the house or going to bed. Periodically check the wires. They should not be warm to the touch. Be careful to avoid overloading electrical outlets. And always follow the manufacturer's instructions for your lights. How often should you put water in the tree stand? You should water your tree frequently, making sure it remains moist. 
Check every day to make sure there's enough water. Christmas trees stored outside should be placed in a bucket of water. Remember, a wet tree is a safe tree. When is it time to throw your tree out? If your tree's needles start dropping off in abundance and the branches get dry and start drooping, it's time to get rid of the tree. It's also a good idea not to purchase and put your tree up too early. If you buy a healthy tree and maintain it, the tree should be safe for about two weeks. After two weeks, get rid of it. Don't cut your tree up and burn it in your fireplace. Instead, bring it to a recycling center or put it out for curbside pickup. You can see how easy it is for a dried out, neglected Christmas tree to contribute to a home fire. But that's only one way your house could potentially get burned during the holidays. Believe me, you can never let your guard down. It's easy for a fire to start if you're not careful. Um, one of the first fatalities I ever made uh, had probably been a firefighter for less than two weeks. Uh, we received a call for an apartment fire. Uh, we responded. Once we entered the apartment, it was uh, very heavy smoke. It banked down to probably about the uh, knee level, so we had to crawl to make entry. Uh, we found uh, a female and we managed to pull her out, and we passed her out to other firefighters who managed to bring her out. We found the fire room. Uh, the fire went out uh, fast, extremely quick, because it was confined to the bedroom. Heavy uh, heat and smoke damage throughout the apartment. We crawled in and uh, immediately uh, broke a window to help ventilate some of the heavy smoke out of the apartment. I had a flashlight and I shined a flashlight and uh, I at first thought it was a styrofoam head. Uh, it wasn't recognizable to me as a human form. Uh, once a lot of the smoke had cleared, uh, we were able to determine that there was uh, a person in the apartment complex. He, we found him between two twin beds uh, his clothes were completely burned off of him. Uh, that's the type of thing you never forget. As, as you may recall, I was a young firefighter, was not uh, familiar with seeing uh, a lot of this stuff. And that's the kind of images that are, that are going to stay with me forever. I'll never forget the guy's name. I'll never forget the position that he was in. I'll never forget the agony on his face. Uh, the sad part about it all was it was caused by a candle. Uh, this guy and his, his girlfriend were just trying to have a romantic evening and uh, a lit candle fell behind the bed and, and caused the death of this promising young man. Candles are nice looking during the holiday season. They add to a nice cozy atmosphere and they give off a nice smell. But don't be fooled by their warm glow and their nice scent. They can be very dangerous if not used properly. Recent annual statistics show about 15,000 home fires were started by candles. Those fires led to about 102 civilian deaths, about 1,500 injuries, and $278 million of property damage, all because of a little candlelight that got out of control. Here are some spot quiz questions about candles. First, at what point do you determine a candle shouldn't be burned anymore? Next, what is the ideal length for a candle wick? And how are candle fires most commonly started? Jot those questions down and see if you have the answers. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Fires caused by candles are four times as likely to happen during the winter holidays. Don't burn a candle anymore when it has two inches or less of wax left. Keep candles away from curtains or other flammable materials and never leave a candle unattended. This message brought to you by the Facts on Fire Network. We're back in the studio with Chief Boudreaux again. Chief, can you tell us of a situation where you responded to a call uh, that where a candle caused the fire? Yeah, I can recall one that's particularly amusing. We had a couple of kids playing with a candle, knew they weren't supposed to do it, so when their mom came in, they hurried up and shoved the candle under the bed and ran into the living room to greet their mom like nothing had happened. A few minutes later, the smoke detector went off. Mom saw smoke billowing out of their bedroom and evacuated the building, dialed 911. Fortunately, they were next door to the fire station. We extinguished the fire rapidly, only did minor damage to the, the room and contents. Nobody was injured. 
and we found the candle under the bed that had caused the fire, and the kids confessed to it instantly. Quite a wake-up call for them, I bet. Right. Uh, well, other than shoving a candle under a bed, uh, what are some more common ways that a candle can cause a fire? Uh, candles being left unattended, uh, candles placed too close to combustible materials, uh, candles that their wicks are too long, thereby the flame extends high above the candle, uh, or candles that you burn too short. Okay, uh, the use of a candle, uh, you can't just necessarily get a candle and start burning it. There are some precautions that you should take before you use a candle in the home? Right. Uh, usually when you buy your candles, the, the wick is a little extra long. You should trim that wick down. Ideal length is about a quarter of an inch. Uh, if you're burning the stick type candles in holders, make sure that the base is good and solid, that they're, they're firmly planted in there. And when they burn down to about two inches left, dispose of the candle. Uh, candles that are held within uh, containers, you can go ahead and burn those till about half inch of the wax is left, and then you need to dispose of those also. Uh, of course, you mentioned the, uh, the fire there with the kids uh, having the candle in the bedroom. Is that a place to have candles at, normally in the bedroom? No, we never advocate candles in the bedroom. It's too easy to light the candle and then fall asleep and, and then the candles left unattended can burn down, start a fire. Uh, and again, the children playing with the candle is, is never a good idea. They should be left out of reach of children. Uh, you hear stories sometimes about people using candles to uh, check pilot lights, uh, to try to light them or check for gas leaks and heater connections, uh, advisable or not? not advisable at all. We've also seen candles being used during storms, hurricanes, things of that nature, uh, while they're refueling kerosene lanterns, kerosene heaters, things of that nature. Not a good idea. You have flammable, combustible liquids in close proximity to your candles. Not wise. Chief, what about that candle that's left maybe too close to an open or cracked window? Could the wind maybe move that drape or curtain over towards the flame? Certainly, as we discussed you should never have your candle too close to any combustibles such as draperies, tablecloths, uh, bed linens, things of that nature that could be blown near the candle, ignited, and thus causing a house fire. Thanks a lot. Let's summarize what we should be doing to keep candles safe. The wick length should be about a quarter of an inch long. A candle is too short when it burns to two inches of wax or less. Keep candles away from flammable materials like curtains or furniture. Keep children away from candles and matches, and don't burn candles in bedrooms. Keep candles at least three inches away from each other. Be careful with wet wax pools. Never use candles to check pilot lights or fueling equipment like a kerosene heater or lantern. And finally, never ever leave candles unattended. Blow them out when you leave the room or the house. Let's talk about some of the common myths or misperceptions uh, in regarding candles. Uh, the candle that's left unattended, uh, is that okay? I believe that's one of the largest misconceptions or myths about candles is that they're self-extinguishing. Whenever they burn out, they'll just burn themselves out and be okay. The fact is that these candles start thousands of house fires annually. So there's no candle that you can just leave unattended and it's just going to burn itself out. You, you must put that candle out yourself. Yes, and in fact, uh, if you're burning candles prior to leaving the house, going to bed, go back, double check, make sure that you've extinguished those candles. Uh, never leave it to chance because just that small flame on the end of a candle left unattended for a few minutes can cause a raging inferno with catastrophic results. Bad stuff. Thanks a lot for dispelling some of these myths today. Did you know during the month of December, there are almost twice as many candle fires as any other month of the year? Keep your home and family safe by taking proper candle precautions. And make sure you have a working smoke alarm installed on each level of your house. Test them monthly to make sure the battery works and have an escape plan for your family in case of a fire. Proper preparation can mean the difference between life and death. This message from the Facts on Fire television network. Here are the answers to the spot quiz. At what point do you determine a candle shouldn't be burned anymore? If the candle placed in a candle holder gets down to two inches of wax, then it's time to get rid of the candle. If a candle burns down to half an inch in a container, 
then you should quit burning it. Next, what is the ideal length for a candle wick? The ideal length of the candle wick is about one quarter of an inch. If the wick is too long, trim it before lighting the candle. If a candle begins to smoke and flicker, or gets too high, then extinguish the flame, let it cool, and then trim the wick, and then relight it. If a flame is burning calmly, it's a sign that the candle is burning cleanly and safely. And how are candle fires most commonly started? Most candle fires are started when people forget that candles are burning and leave the room for a long period of time. Sometimes putting candles too close to combustible materials causes fires. And in other instances, a fire is started when people, usually children, are playing with a candle. So candles can be very dangerous. Don't ever leave a candle unattended. When you go out, blow the candle out. I can't stress enough how important it is to take the proper precautions to make sure you don't accidentally start a candle fire. All it takes is seconds for a raging fire to begin. Just this past holiday season between Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, uh, one instance stands out in my mind where, where a family lost everything they had, everything, a total loss. Uh, due to complacency and inattention, uh, responsibilities shared or thought to be shared by each other and neglect. What I mean by that is someone uh, to be in charge of a task of, of putting the turkey in the oven, monitoring the turkey, another one to be doing this dressing and what have you. Well, what happened was uh, company, people started arriving, person designated this task, got uh, tied up, didn't, didn't, and didn't remember. Turns out, it wasn't that the turkey was forgotten, the stove malfunctioned. Here we were with a, with a house full of people. At any given time, somebody could have, could have seen, smelled, saw what was going on. By the time someone did see what was going on, it was too late. And this kitchen fire evolved and got out of control before we could ever get you know, water on it and, and try, to, try to save it properly. Did you know cooking is the leading cause of home fires in the United States? It's also the top cause of fire injuries. Cooking fires are easy to avoid if you take the right precautions. This message brought to you by the Facts on Fire Network. First, what is the leading cause of home fires in the U.S.? Next, what kind of clothes are best to wear when cooking on a stove? What are two of the best ways for you to minimize fires in your kitchen? Finally, what should you do if you have a grease fire on the stovetop? Jot those questions down and try to answer them. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Here's the scene. The family is gathered together for a much anticipated holiday. The kitchen is in a frenzy with people baking turkeys, making dressing, and baking grandma's delicious pie. The great aromas, happy jubilation, and cohesive family fun. What could go wrong with such a quaint American picture? A kitchen fire, that's what. With all the distractions, all the people, it's easy to forget the dangers lurking in that cozy culinary headquarter. It's like getting behind the wheel of your car. On the highways, lack of preparation can mean serious injury or death. Same holds true in the kitchen. Join me again is Fire Chief Boudreaux. Chief Boudreaux, I'm sure in your career you've seen many kitchen fires. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of those that started in the kitchen? The majority of the fires that I've seen throughout my career have been kitchen fires. Uh, most of them from unattended pots on the stove or grease from improperly maintained or cleaned equipment. It is a leading cause of fires. So uh, let's kind of go back and uh, think about that safe kitchen or having a safe kitchen, some precautions that we should take to prevent that kitchen from being a fire hazard. Uh, never leave your stove unattended. Stoves or ovens unattended with, with cooking utensils or pots, pans, things of that nature. Uh, always make sure that your pot holders, towels are far enough away from the burner so that they don't ignite. Uh, clean up any spills, grease or spilled food before they have a chance to ignite. How about kids and pets in the kitchen? Is that something that we need to be wary of? Never a good idea. I've seen several children burned by walking by the store having handles hanging off the counter, they'll reach up, grab those handles, pull down burning materials on them, uh, spill grease, start a kitchen fire, things like that. 
Chief, what should someone do if they discover they have a fire on the stove top or in the oven? If it's a fire on the stove top in a pan, you can extinguish that fire by simply putting a lid on it, smother the fire out. Uh, never put water on a grease fire, and the wives' tale about flour doesn't really work either. Flour's a flammable dust. Uh, so baking soda is another one that works well. A fire extinguisher should always be handy, readily accessible to you, and you should know how to use it. Care should be used in using that fire extinguisher because if you have a grease fire on the stove and you shoot the fire extinguisher directly down into the grease, it will gouge that grease and splatter grease up into the air and ignite it, causing the fire to grow. So proper extinguisher training is also important because if you don't have it, then you're not really going to do any good. You may do more damage to yourself and your property. Right. Uh, you mentioned flour earlier, uh, that it's a flammable dust. Uh, does the same hold true for things like the, uh, the processed coffee creamers? Does it work uh, in the bad sense the same way that flour would? Yeah, similar to, to, to flour, I wouldn't use anything but baking soda or an approved fire extinguisher on a kitchen fire. Uh, we talked about the stove top fire. Now, what about that oven fire? Um, you know, what, what do you do as far as that oven fire goes? We've seen several oven fires. These fires are, are generally fairly well contained to the oven. If we just leave the door closed, get out of the house, dial 911, let the fire department come in and take care of it. The majority of that fire will be contained by virtue of the fact that the oven is designed to contain that heat within the oven. You may have some smoke released into the house, some smoke damage, but not a lot of fire damage. If you dial 911, the fire department responds fairly quickly. Uh, typically, that oven fire would probably be uh, discovered, you know, someone notices maybe some smoke coming out of the, the closed door. They open the door, a lot of smoke comes out, maybe some flame. Should they just immediately turn and run to get out of the house and make that call to 911, or is there something they could do just before that? Just slam that door back closed and evacuate the house. Hopefully, you'll be alerted early enough by your smoke detectors that the problem will not get out of hand. Okay. Uh, would, uh, how about turning the oven off? Can, can we turn the oven off when we close the door? Or does it matter? Sure. It's always a good idea to cut the fuel source, the heat source, uh, and that will help mitigate the fire in some instances. Let's talk about cooking uh, outside the home. Uh, you know, everyone likes to barbecue. Uh, gas, charcoal grills, uh, any hazards involved there? Yeah, they're a leading cause of fires also. They're lumped in with those cooking fires and, and leading cause of home fire. Uh, your gas grills, your charcoal grills, you should always make sure that you're far enough away from the house, away from any patio coverings, decks, uh, trees, things that could be ignited by the, the cooking process or by igniting the charcoal. And in charcoal fires, we should always use an approved lighter fluid. Don't use any other combustible liquids or chemicals in place of lighter fluid to try and light those charcoals. Gasoline would be one of those that you're talking about, right? Very dangerous, highly explosive. Let's talk a little bit about these gas grills, a little bit more specific uh, where they're concerned. Uh, powered by uh, uh, natural gas or uh, LPG in these cylinders, uh, what, do, uh, what hazards do they present themselves? The cylinders pr present a particular hazard when they're involved in fire. They do have an overpressure device on them. They will ventilate before they rupture. However, during that ventilation, they will release gas into the fire area, creating huge potential for fire spread. So uh, how important is it that uh, we're very careful about where we locate uh, the gas grills, and even the charcoal grills uh, for that matter? very important to be at least 30 feet safe distance from the house, let's say. Uh, in the charcoal grills, you're going to be putting charcoal starter fluid on them. Um, flame gas grills, same thing. You have the potential from the gas stored in the bottles. Uh, also, you need to locate in an area where your kids are not going to be running by, playing, knocking over the grill, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Kids, pets, uh, they can really be hurt by, by a barbecue grill. So it should be a little bit more isolated uh, so you don't have any of these right. things that, that could cause a problem. Out of a common path of travel. Okay. Uh, one that's maybe uh, not necessarily out of a common path of travel, we still have them outdoors now. They're a lot more prominent these days, and that's these portable outdoor fireplaces. Uh, different brands, different sizes, different types. Uh, do they present any specific hazards? We've seen real problems with them. Uh, fireplaces generally don't cause us that big of a problem. They're built to code when the house is built. These portable fireplaces, people go to the store, they pick them up, they come, they set them up on their porch, on their balcony, on their patio outside. 
uh, no specific distance from the house, no clearance to the eaves, and no thought or concern as to where the embers or sparks are venting to, and they cause huge problems for the fire department. Chief, I'm sure there's some misperceptions out there about some of these outdoor fireplaces. Uh, one being uh, maybe that it's okay to build any size fire that you like in the outdoor fireplace? Certainly not. Common sense has to come into play. Uh, your fire size is going to depend on the size of the outdoor fireplace, its location, but most importantly we need to exercise good common sense and safety here. Build a moderate size fire one that's easily contained within that fireplace and have a safe distance from the home so that embers uh, and brands that pop off of it are not going to cause a problem. Uh, another one might be uh, you hear whether it's a barbecue pit or an outdoor fireplace where someone may use the lighter fluid to uh, spray more and more lighter fluid on the fire to get that larger fire. Uh, is that a safe practice? Absolutely not. Uh, charcoal starting fluid should be placed on your combustibles, i.e. your firewood, your charcoal, prior to lighting that fire. You can go ahead and soak them down really well in it before you light the fire. But after that fire is lit, when you spray that on there, it could follow up that trail of liquid coming out of the bottle and cause the entire bottle to combust in your hands. All right. Very dangerous. So uh, we've talked about uh, cooking fires both in the home, out of the home, uh, whether it's on the stove, in the oven, uh, barbecue pits, gas or charcoal, the outdoor fireplaces. A uh, lot of good information there. Thanks a lot. Here's a summary of what you can do to keep your kitchen safe from a fire. Have a three-foot zone around the oven where kids and pets are not allowed. Avoid wearing loose-fitting clothing. Don't leave cooking food unattended. Make sure you turn off the stove when you're finished. Each night before you go to bed, make sure the oven and burners are off. Turn pot handles in to avoid dangerous spills. Clean food off your stovetop and oven. Have a fire extinguisher handy in the kitchen. Know how to use it and make sure you have an exit path if the fire gets out of hand. If a pot is on fire, don't panic. Move the lid over the flames. If you have an oven fire, close the door and turn off the oven. Never throw water or flour on a pan fire. It can splatter or explode on you. Use baking soda. And finally, have a working smoke alarm near the kitchen. A timely response can be crucial. Chief, let's talk about some of these misconceptions uh, uh, that we have during the holiday cooking season. Uh, what are some things that uh, we can address there? I believe that the comfort level that people have with cooking and cooking equipment leads them to believe that it's safe. It just takes a moment of complacency, however, to cause a catastrophic fire at the holidays. Thanks a lot for that. We'll hopefully have a safer holiday now. Thank you. Cooking fires in the kitchen aren't the only source of fire. During cookouts, gas and charcoal grills are a prime hazard for fires. In a recent annual report, grills caused 1,500 structure fires and 4,200 outdoor fires. One year's worth of grill fires accounted for about $30 million of property damage. Whether in the kitchen or on the patio, take precautions to prevent cooking fires. This message brought to you by the Facts on Fire television network. And here are the answers to the spot quiz. What is the leading cause of home fires in the U.S.? Unattended cooking is the leading cause of fires in U.S. homes. Make sure that someone is always checking on food being cooked. Don't get distracted so much that you lose awareness of what's happening in the kitchen. Next, what kind of clothes are best to wear when cooking on a stove? It's best to wear tight-fitting clothing around the stovetop. Loose-fitting clothes can accidentally end up in a pot or on a hot stovetop without you even knowing about it. And, of course, that makes it easier for you to catch on fire or get burned. If you have loose, long sleeves, roll them up. What are two of the best ways for you to minimize fires in your kitchen? Keep children and pets away from the stove. Keep a three-foot buffer zone or safe zone around your stove when you're cooking. Also, turn pot handles inward to avoid hitting and spilling hot pots and pans. 
Finally, what should you do if you have a grease fire on the stovetop? If you have a fire on the stovetop, put a lid on the pan to smother it. Baking soda also works if sprinkled on the fire. Do not, I repeat, do not throw water on a grease fire. Don't ever believe a fire can't start in your kitchen. Remember that cooking accidents are the leading cause of house fires. By following some common sense advice, you can minimize your chances of having an unwelcome stovetop fire or a backyard barbecue fire at home. Different times of the year, he different different conditions. Summer months, Fourth of July, things are dry. You're not getting the rain. People are shooting Roman cannons, bottle rockets. You're in your own or on your own property, yet no one thinks of where these things are landing, if they're completely extinguished when they land. So many times I've seen residences, buildings, businesses, property, large loss of property due to the neglect and inattention of, of people using said firewood. Okay, here's the picture. It's New Year's Eve, or the 4th of July, and you want to light up the skies with blast and color. It's supposed to be fun, right? then someone gets a hand blown off or a face burnt or someone is killed. It might sound far-fetched, but thousands of injuries and some deaths happen every year because of fireworks. That's why it's important to be prepared when using them. Here's a quick test of your knowledge. First, what type of fireworks most commonly cause injury? Next, what age group is at the highest risk to be injured by fireworks? Third, are sparklers the most friendly fireworks for little kids to use? During a public fireworks show, how far should the audience stand back from the actual explosives? Are fireworks legal in all states? And finally, what are the proper precautions you should take when preparing to shoot fireworks? Jot those questions down and try to answer them. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Once again, we have Chief Rick Goudreau here with us. Uh, Chief, can you tell us, uh, is, is there such a thing as safe fireworks? No. All fireworks are dangerous uh, by their very nature. I mean, they explode, they give off sparks, they have the potential to do harm if not used properly. Is it legal to use fireworks in any area? Currently, seven states have bans on fireworks. Some states do allow fireworks, however, they ban individual types of fireworks. Uh, usually Class C consumer fireworks are available in all but those seven states mentioned. However, you need to find out if your local municipality or the region that you live in has some type of ban or prohibits those fireworks. So state to state doesn't necessarily make, make them legal state to state or even community to community. Okay. Uh, what type of fireworks uh, should someone look for to minimize that chance of injury? There are several fireworks out there that statistically cause less injuries, uh, fountains, Roman candles, snakes, things of that nature, uh, low impact type fireworks. What are some uh, safety steps that, uh, that people can take when they're actually shooting these fireworks off? Uh, most important thing, read the directions. All fireworks have directions and precautions by law written on them. You have adult supervision. Children should never be left unattended. Small children should never use fireworks. Larger children should always be carefully supervised by an adult. What about uh, homemade fireworks? You, know, you, don't, you don't buy them, you just make them yourself. Uh, those safe things to use? Fireworks should never be homemade or should never be modified. They should use, be used exactly as directed on the packaging. Sometimes you go to the fireworks stand and uh, you get uh, you get you know, some fireworks to shoot off, and you begin to do the, to, to shoot the fireworks off, and you have what's called a dud. Uh, what, do you, what do we do with the duds? Should we pick them up, maybe relight them, or leave them alone? What, what do you say? We should never pick up a dud or stand over a dud. Uh, the best thing you can do with that is have a bucket of water container with a container handy nearby. We'll go get a bucket of water, come pour it over that dud, or at least a small container, pour it over that dud, saturate it so that you make sure that, that the fire is out, it's not going to go off and then dispose of it. Okay, while you're shooting your fireworks, uh, 
you know, maybe you, you have a lot with you, uh, should you fire, your, fire them off in the area that you're storing the rest of your fireworks at? No. It, it's, it goes back to the cartoon days. You, you'll always see them drop the match in the box of dynamite or something of right. that nature. It, it's never a good idea to have your cache of fireworks too close to where you're shooting your fireworks off. You're just inviting catastrophe. Uh, all of these things you're talking about, uh, you know, typically common sense stuff for, for us adults. Right. Uh, children, on the other hand, completely different story. Uh, where, where do children fall in uh, as far as the hazards of using fireworks? Once again, small children should never use fireworks. Larger children, strict supervision by an adult. There is no such thing as a safe firework. A lot of people have the misperception that, oh, we'll let the kids play with the sparklers, they're safe. Those sparklers burn at over a thousand degrees. Would you really hand your kids a cutting torch and say, here, play with this? Right. right. It's just not a wise idea. Uh, so, assuming that these things were to happen, uh, I, I've run several calls involving fireworks in my career. I'm sure you have too. What type of injuries uh, have you seen or the potential for injuries are there with the misuse of fireworks? Right. Uh, most prevalent injury is burns. Over 60% of the firework related injuries are burns. About another 20% result from contusions or lacerations from the actual explosion of the firework. And the remainder vary widely from eye injuries, ear injuries, things of that nature. So overall supervision, uh, extremely important. Very, very important. Adult supervision, paying very close attention to how the fireworks are being used. Never allow them to put them in any metal containers, glass containers. Strictly use them as they are directed. So Chief, uh, it may be safe for uh, someone to uh, shoot these fireworks in a supervised area and all that, legal in their neighborhood or municipality, but what about uh, firing these things off just within the neighborhood? Although it's legal, what hazards are there in the neighborhood themselves? Well, certainly we need to make sure that we're safe distances from houses and outbuildings before we use our fireworks, fire our fireworks off. Uh, also dry leaves, dry grass, uh, any combustible materials like that that could start a fire. Uh, we see every year, 4th of July, New Year's Eve, uh, because of the dead dry grass, summer heat, winter cold, uh, we usually see some grass fires and, and fires inherent to these fireworks. So, so it is safe to say that uh, a firework uh, used improperly in the wrong area could potentially cause what we call a wildland fire that could be devastating to, to a neighborhood or to an area. Certainly. It's prohibited in most states in, in the West where fire, wildland fires are a huge problem. Uh, however, even locally and, and even used properly, these fireworks have the potential to cause grass fires uh, and structural fires given, given the wrong conditions. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, you've got your fireworks, you've got people around. Um, is it something that you want to, to do alone? Uh, is it okay to have a crowd gathered around you while you're lighting your fireworks off? Certainly everybody wants to get in on the fun. Everybody wants to enjoy the fireworks. However, when you are lighting them, you should make sure that everybody is aware that the fireworks are being lit and that everybody is a safe distance away from them. So, you know, everyone wants to shoot fireworks. You know, all the kids like fireworks. Uh, but it may not be legal in the area. It may not be safe in the area, even if it's legal. Uh, how about some alternatives? Uh, how, can, how can we enjoy fireworks without doing anything illegal or anything hazardous? Well, generally for the holidays, as we mentioned, New Year's, Fourth of July, uh, there are usually some really well choreographed professional shows in almost every municipality, every locality has them. Take the kids to see them. These guys are professionally trained, certified technicians. They meet strict NFPA standards on the size of shell they're shooting, the clearance that they have to have from the crowd. Usually their shows are licensed by the state fire marshals or their local authorities having jurisdiction. So that is a good, safe alternative to going out and buying consumer fireworks, especially if they're not available in your area or it's just not safe to shoot them in your area. So the best thing to do is just go out, enjoy the show, let somebody else do all the work. Huh? Exactly right. Thanks very much. Great. So yes, it uh, is a serious problem. Uh, according to the National Fire Protection Association, recent numbers show an average of nine people per year being killed in fire started by fireworks, and an average of seven people per year that were directly killed by fireworks. 
Experts generally consider fireworks one of the most risky consumer products available. 50% of people injured by fireworks are 19 years old and younger, with a quarter of those injuries happening to children 14 years or younger. So it's vitally important for us to do all we can do to solve this very real problem. Here's a summary of holiday fireworks safety. Never let young kids play with fireworks. Adults should make sure it's legal to use fireworks in their area of the country and read all directions on the firework packages. Be sure no one is close to the firing area. Never attempt to relight fireworks that haven't gone off. Never place any portion of your body over a firework when you're lighting it. Closely supervise any older kids with fireworks. And do not use homemade fireworks. Leave fireworks construction to the professionals. It's estimated that 120 to 130 million pounds of fireworks are used per year. What makes consumer or Class C fireworks most risky is the fact that most people so infrequently use them, once or twice a year. So they fail to understand the risks and neglect following the proper guidelines. Read the directions and respect fireworks or they can destroy you. This message brought to you by the Facts on Fire Network. So, Chief, uh, as we've talked uh, earlier today and some of the other items we've uh, discussed, uh, misperceptions, misconceptions, uh, what about uh, misconceptions regarding fireworks? Uh, one of the biggest things that we see with fireworks, uh, even though people know that they're prohibited in their community, illegal to have in their community, they will drive long distances if they have to to purchase these things across a county line, parish line, outside of a city limit and then bring them back into that community and they think that it's not that serious an offense, it's not that serious a law. However, a, there was a reason for that law being put into place. It's because of the danger level of those fireworks in that community. They've experienced problems with them before. Uh, it may be a confined area. Uh, very close housing where it's, it's caused fires. It may be somewhere like you have out west with the, the high potential for wildland, urban interface fires. So they've been prohibited for a reason. We need to just go ahead and accept that. And like I said earlier, let's go see a, a professionally done, well choreographed show somewhere. Let them do the work for you. So, Chief, in regards to all the topics that we've discussed today, uh, I'm, I assume I'm safe in saying that safety is always going to be the key. Safety is always our greatest concern, especially at the holidays, because as we've discussed today, there are so many things that can go wrong just in a, a moment's notice that can ruin our holidays, cause some great catastrophe. It's always best to, to always be vigilant in what we're doing. You know, our lighting, our Christmas trees, uh, fireworks, whatever the, the, the task at hand is, cooking our, our holiday dinners. If we can just be vigilant and maintain a level of safety, everybody will have a happy and safe holiday season. Chief, you provided us with some very helpful information today. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank, Thank you for having me. And here are the answers to your spot quiz test. First, what type of fireworks most commonly cause injury? Firework rockets, small firecrackers, and sparklers in that order. Next, what age group is most likely to be injured by fireworks? The highest rate is among teens, particularly those 14 years and younger. Third, are sparklers the most friendly fireworks for little kids to use? Sparklers are able to reach temperatures above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so they're very dangerous, not a toy for kids. Are fireworks legal in all states? No. Presently, there are seven states that ban all consumer fireworks. During a public fireworks show, how far should the audience stand back from the actual explosives? Some experts recommend that viewers be at least 500 feet or up to a quarter of a mile away from the firework firing zone. And finally, what are the proper precautions you should take when preparing to shoot fireworks? First, read warnings and directions. Follow your state and city's laws. Small children should not be allowed to play with or light fireworks. Light fireworks outside in a clear, level area, 
away from houses, leaves, and flammable materials. Keep a bucket of water handy for emergencies and for pouring on dud firecrackers. Do not try to relight a dud firework. Never place any portion of your body directly over or in front of a firework when lighting it. So there you have it. Over the course of the program, you've learned some key principles for protecting yourself, your family, and your property from fire. Christmas trees, candles, stoves, ovens, and fireworks. These are only some of the potential hazards of the holidays. Common sense and a little information can go a long way to making your holidays happy and peaceful. Those are today's Facts on Fire. Thanks for joining us.